Hello and welcome back to AmbiV. I'm Casper and today we're going to catch up with the 1967 Mustang Family Car Project. So today we're finally back in the 1967 Mustang and the reason you haven't seen any other videos on this car recently is because all those videos would essentially be nothing but me throwing tools around my shop and swearing endlessly. So the Blueprint Engine 302 went into the car fairly easily. Unfortunately, once I had it installed in the car, I had all kinds of strange little issues that had nothing to do with the engine or really had anything to do with what I had done, but I didn't know that. So when I installed the new engine, I encountered an issue with the idle not being functional. When I would attempt to diagnose it, I would always think it was a vacuum leak or some other issue, but it was usually so strange I couldn't actually pinpoint a uh, direct cause. Ultimately, the only thing I could settle on was that there was a problem with the brand new distributor that was shipped with the engine. I went ahead and replaced the distributor with an HEI distributor so that it had a new coil set up with it so I wasn't using an external coil and that fixed the issue. Now I don't know if the issue was just that the coil was too weak, I don't know if the issue was that the distributor was not able to handle the advance curve that I needed for the engine, I don't know. The timing looked great every time I tested it, but when it would drop down to idle it would want to die out. Additionally, I fought with the torque converter seeming to want to lock and stick in the transmission. I went ahead and sent one back and got a replacement unit and so far I haven't had the problem again but I still don't know why that would be a problem with a torque converter. So out here on the back roads as you can hear the car's running pretty darn good. It's still louder than I would like. I have tried three different sets of mufflers and right now the car has three mufflers on it. It has a muffled X-pipe, two regular switchback style mufflers, and then just no end, no end tips on it. I don't have it going over the rear axle until I figure out exactly how I want it to look. But this should be enough to keep it quiet, and it does generally at cruising. Here at about 55 miles an hour, it sounds okay. But the vibration in the drone is just very loud down low. So I'm still trying new things out. Ultimately, the car would probably do best with resonators before the X-pipe or deleting the X-pipe and going with an H-pipe so I have more room for a full other set of mufflers. Ultimately, the sound sounded best with something like Magnaflows, but it was just way too loud. I was aggravating every neighbor I had. The Borgensen power steering box that I installed is amazing. It helped fix most of the issues I had with how the car drove and I don't know why I waited so long to do it. The installation actually wasn't that hard. It would have been a little bit more difficult with the engine in the car but really I could get to most of the components I needed to work with. Out here on the back roads you notice that it's a little bit more precise in the steering but you just have generally more confidence than anything else. I have moved it over to the smaller battery, which obviously can start the 302 just fine, but in doing so, I now have an issue where this battery dips just a little low on voltage after a few failed cranks to where it resets the handheld touchscreen for the car. Now, that's an annoying uh, issue, but it's not too bad. It just means sometimes the handheld flashes before it really starts but if we could get a capacitor in line or a slightly bigger battery, that issue would be resolved. The car runs really well. And out here, even going up and down in RPM significantly, I don't get stumbling, I don't get bogging, even with pretty aggressive cams. I wish I had a different transmission. The C4 definitely doesn't make the best use of the power band of the 302 which probably should be able to rev up to well past 5,000 RPM before hitting peak power. And this transmission always wants to shift very low. And 
wants to cruise very high. So cruising on the highway is cruising at 3,000 RPM, which obviously isn't very fuel efficient. Cruising that high also makes you want to speed because you're starting to dip into the good power band and the car just kind of naturally wants to run. Ultimately, the biggest holdups I've had with this car have never been really the fault of the parts companies. In fact, Blueprint Engines did a really good job reaching out to me repeatedly, wanting to talk through the issues and discuss what was going on. I just had such bizarre issues that no one knew what to make of them. I finally got the car to a point where it was doing pretty darn well and I could put some miles on it. And then I encountered issues with other things. I had a slight leak in the heater core, which it never had before, but sometime when it was sitting or when I was pulling on lines or something, I suddenly developed a slight leak. I also encountered some issues where the car seems to have a little bit of a, of a coolant leak or something that is very intermittent. After a long day of driving, I'll see a small little puddle form but I can't really figure out where it's coming from, so I'm guessing it's gotta be at the water neck. I also do not have all my gauges working. My charging gauge doesn't work because I switched to a one wire alternator. The tack is currently just disconnected and the factory temperature gauge never really worked very well, but right now I don't have a water neck in there that has a hole for the sensor, so I don't have it hooked up. I don't really need those, because the handheld unit gives me all the feedback I need, but I would like to get all my instrumentation working. And rather than getting all of this set up as it is, I think I'll probably switch out the gauge cluster so that I have a large tack and just the gauges I really care about, like water temperature and oil pressure and ignore charging. Now, once this car was all sorted, I did notice pretty quickly that the Poly EFI unit, the four barrel setup, is very different in characteristic to the 2300 two barrel unit in several ways. One way is that it seems much more temperamental on the IACV and has an issue where occasionally it forgets itself. And it says it's either at 0% or 100%. And I can obviously tell that it's stuck somewhere in the middle at 50% or something. That causes it manifests as a high idle condition that never goes away until you reboot the car. You either have to shut the car down, restart the car, or you have to um, let it have time to try to unstick itself or squirt something in there. Usually just power cycling the car is enough for it to try to remove the, act the activate the mechanism, solves the problem. The other issue I encountered with it was everything was way too jumpy and instantaneous. So the two components of the four barrel throttle body, the primaries and secondaries, open in unison at one for one activation out of the box. That makes for a very punchy engine if it's not really low horsepower. On something like the 289, it probably wouldn't have been much of an issue because the torque down low wasn't so significant. On the 302, it ended up with spinning the tires whenever you would try to leave a stop sign without being very gentle on the pedal. It was as if you had an eccentric shaped uh, throttle pulley where it was trying to open them very quickly and get to full very quickly. Now, one of the things that it doesn't really, you don't get told when you buy the Sniper EFI unit is that you can, in fact, buy an adjustable linkage between the primaries and secondaries. It costs an insanely high $30 for a little tiny threaded bolt, but that solves the problem completely. By installing that, setting the secondaries to open about the point when the primaries are at 40%, gives you that little bit of lead out to get off stop signs and move around in traffic without a super punchy throttle response. It makes for a much more pleasant street driving experience. You also have a setting within the firmware for the computer that allows you to set it to progressive throttle body linkage, but I don't know what that setting actually does. I'm assuming it does something to do with the injectors, basically having them learn to operate 
disconnected rather than just always operating at the same settings. But that's beyond me because I haven't actually looked into it. And I don't really care. As long as the car's running well enough, I'm fine with it. As part of the issue with the leaking heater core, I decided not to repair the factory unit. This car isn't factory anyway, and I don't really care about trying to preserve really antiquated systems. So I'm going to be installing a vintage air perfect fit system or sure fit system as they call it that will reuse my factory dash controls reuse the mounting location but put in air conditioning and heating in a much more modern package i also reached back out to cbf racing who did my serpentine belt setup and they actually sent me the compressor they recommend with the pulleys and brackets that are needed and basically just charged me a very reasonable fee to just adjust those things. They also sent me a free alternator pulley to help try to get my alternator start charging a little lower in RPM so I can idle the car down lower than it really wants to idle with this one wire alternator. So far, CVF Racing has been amazing to work with. I pay for all my parts, so I do evaluate everything from the perspective of being a customer. But even so, they've done more than most aftermarket parts companies would. I didn't even ask what the price was for the alternator pulley. I just asked if they had a smaller one and they instantly generated a shipping label and sent me another pulley. Everything seems to be quite well finished as well. So I expect the air compressor to be installed with minimal effort. Running lines and things will be the hardest part. Finding somewhere away from these insanely hot headers which I currently still have an exhaust leak on one of them simply because they are Ford headers and that I've always had issues with thin Ford headers wanting to leak after they get heat cycled a few times. As soon as I get my new exhaust gasket, I should be able to fix that issue. Other than those, those minor things left, I've overcome all of the major hurdles that were preventing me from driving the car and currently, I've actually done my first oil change, switched over to synthetic, and I've got the car to the point where I was confident enough to take it to an autocross event and try it out. Now, that didn't go so well because the cheapy Chinese power steering lines that were shipped with the CJ Pony Parts uh, power steering kit were never able to seat quite right and when I actually started really using the power steering system, they started leaking pretty badly, so I had to cut my day short. Ultimately, I pulled them back apart and spent a lot more time looking them over and in the dishing for where the cone should seal on the pump side, on the high pressure line, there was a slight burr and imperfection to it. I took some sandpaper to it, just smoothed it out and the pump side, went ahead and snugged it down nice and tight, probably tighter than you should have to for a friction system like that, and it fixed the problem. So now that the power steering's working again, I'm gonna give it a little more tests, and then I'm gonna take it to the next autocross and just test the car out there, see where its limits are. I don't expect it to do too well with a C4 transmission and these little tiny tires on it, but I found autocross is a great way to quickly weed out unknown issues. So now that I'm heading back onto a main highway, I think that's a good place to leave the video. So thank you all for watching. I will have some more detailed videos on this car here in the near future. I'm trying to avoid rain showers right now, so I don't have much time to do them. But as soon as I do, I will get into some of the detail on what I ran into the engine swap and my overall thoughts. If you have any questions, Leave them in the comments below, and as always, I'll see you in the next video.